second story. So if you're watching the recording, go ahead and round up the kids for our, our time together. We're going to be in Mark. I'm going to read a passage of scripture. We're going to talk about a very familiar story from the pages of God's word. We'll start in Mark chapter 4 and verse number 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was, in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? The disciples, the disciples were following Jesus. In fact, in verse number 35, Jesus said, Let us pass over unto the other side of the sea. So they get in the boat with Jesus, and while they're in the boat, a storm comes about. And, you know, they, they did not expect to come across a storm. They expected to pass peacefully over to the other side of the sea. They were not looking for a storm to happen. They, weren't, they didn't want a storm to happen, but it happened nonetheless. You know, the truth is, boys and girls, uh, men, men and women, people of all ages, Storms happen in our lives, and we're never, ever looking for a storm to happen, right? And, and even the disciples, as they, as they were traveling across that sea, they were doing so because Jesus told them to. A lot of the times, we think that bad things happen, and we feel like when bad things happen to us, that they're happening to, happening to us because we've done something wrong. We, we think that they're happening to us because God is punishing us for something that we did. But the truth is that the Bible tells us that if you're a child of God, God does not punish us for our sin. The Bible tells us that Jesus already took all the punishment for every sin that we already committed. So sometimes bad things happen, and it's not because we deserve them. It's because God is using that storm, so to speak, in our lives as a test. God allows something bad to happen to you, a trial, something that you're struggling with, because God wants to test your faith. And so the disciples, they were experiencing a test of their faith. Right? They, they came upon this storm. And you can see that, that they're looking around, they're looking at all the waves that are, that are crashing against the boat, they're looking at the stormy skies, they're looking at the darkness, they're looking and seeing the wind beating against the ship. But one thing that they weren't doing is that they were looking to Jesus. Right? They go to Jesus and they say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They say, they're looking at all these things. These, this storm, all, all the effects of this storm, and they're saying, Jesus, don't you care about us? But what they were forgetting about is that it doesn't matter whether or not there's a storm going on. Jesus always cares. In fact, sometimes when, when we experience a storm in our lives, sometimes it's exactly because Jesus cares. Jesus sometimes sends storms in our lives because he loves us. Right? We, don't, we shouldn't be looking at our surroundings to figure out whether or not Jesus loves us. That's what the disciples were doing. They, they said, Jesus, you're allowing this storm, and it's going to kill us. You, do you even care about our lives? They should know that Jesus cares about their lives because he came down to earth to be with them, to seek and to save the lost. And no matter, what, no matter what happens to us in our lives, we can be confident that Jesus loves us, not because life's going well, not because we have all the things we want to have, not because all the people in our family are healthy. While so, all those things are great and we're thankful when those things are happening, the reason that we can know that God loves us is that Jesus came to the earth and died on the cross for our sins. And so they, they come to Jesus and they say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus gets up and he says, Peace be 
still. And he tells them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Faith is not based on our circumstances, right? Faith, faith is not based on what's happening to us. Faith, boys and girls, men and women, everyone in, under the sound of my voice this morning, faith is based on the word of God. So Jesus, after he rebukes the wind and the waves, and, he, and then he talks to the disciples, the Bible says that they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him. They look at Jesus and they say, what kind of man is this that he can rebuke the wind and the seas and they stop? The point of this story, boys and girls, is not for us to say, Jesus can calm my storms in my life. Jesus can tell the, the storms in my life to go away. That's not the point, because sometimes the truth is, Jesus doesn't make the storms and the seas go away. He, 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 sometimes he allows those storms to continue in our lives to make us more like him. The point of this story is for us to look at Jesus and say, what manner of man is this the question of this story is not whether or not Jesus can calm the storm the question of the story is who is Jesus to you who is Jesus to you both to those who don't know Jesus I ask that question is Jesus a mere teacher is he just a prophet is he a good person that doesn't line up with what he said. If, if you believe that, then you also believe that he was a liar. He can't, he can't be a good teacher. He claimed to be God. And if you're a believer this morning, I want to ask you, is Jesus the God of your life? Boys and girls, is Jesus your master, your Lord? Your, is he the one who's in control of everything and the one whom you've surrendered everything to? Who is Jesus, to you. Thank you very much for listening. At this time, we're going to have a special song from Maggie. Thank you.
everybody? Hey, that's pretty good. Sometimes they say that at the 11 o'clock when we were having service at 11 o'clock and I get some little good morning, good morning. At 9.30, if you're here, you're awake, right? Some of you are like, Bill, we know we got waters over here in this cooler, but if we like had espresso shots, you know, man, it would really help me out a little bit. But uh, you can always bring your own coffee if you need it. And I'm glad to have you here today. Thank you for coming and being with us. And uh, looking forward to uh, our study today. We're going to continue our look in Ephesians here in just a moment. But if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn in two places, if you would. First, I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 3, and then Ephesians chapter number 6. Colossians 3, and then Ephesians chapter number 6. And again, if you need some water, any of that stuff, you feel free to go up there and get some. You know, we'll be glad for you to have it. It's there for you. And I tell you, each week, this is the fifth week we've been outside and uh, having our pavilion service. And again, it was just, it's awesome to have this, and I'm thanking God for it. We were telling some people yesterday we were playing wiffle ball. And uh, when we were playing wiffle ball, someone asked, they said, uh, asked about the pavilion. I said, honestly, if this whole thing was 2019, we would not have this. Because I don't know if a lot of you remember, this thing didn't get built and finished until like mid-August last year. So uh, everybody would just be happy with seeing me on the camera, you know, as far as that. And, and I always, as I always like the, the joke, but I'm 100% serious. It is a lot easier preaching and teaching to people <laughs> than it is a camera. Uh, so, but we're going to look at some things here in Colossians chapter 3, mainly in Ephesians 6 in a moment. But before we do, let's just stop and ask God to bless us and be with us today. And uh, just thank him for this, this weather we have. Okay, let's go to him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. And bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Father, we want to thank you so much for this day. As you say in your word, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And Lord, may that be the song of our heart this morning. But Father, when we pillow our head tonight, may we also say this is your day. And whatever we face in it, whatever you bring along our path, that we still will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for being a God of love, a God of mercy, Lord, a God of just, though, a God of conviction. And Lord, I pray as we look in your word for these next few moments that you would take the veil away. Lord, I pray that the devil would not steal whatever seed that you have for our hearts today. And Lord, as we broach this topic as we have had over the last few weeks, Lord, I pray that the word of God would speak. May it pour down like rain to help us to see what you'd have for us to see. Lord, I want to thank you for everyone that's here today. Lord, whether they're here under this pavilion or whether they be listening uh, through the live stream, God, I pray that you would just be with them. Lord, I pray if they need direction in life, Lord, you would give that guidance. God, if we need conviction in our life, Lord, I pray you would do it lovingly. But Lord, get our attention however you need to get it. Thank you that you love us enough to chasten us. Lord, I pray for those that are without Christ, that today they might see their need not to be a better person, but to put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your love. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to be in uh, Ephesians just in a moment. We're going to look at Colossians here in just a minute. But just as you know, we've been going through uh, a series in the book of Ephesians for, for many weeks. In fact, we started, it was pre-pandemic, if you would, going through it, looking at the different chapters of Ephesians. And we said, just as a reminder, chapters 1, 2, and 3 are basically Paul is teaching what God has done. What God has done when it talks about that we are saved by grace and it talks about how we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God in chapter 2, who is rich in mercy. And we see that how in chapter 1 even he makes us holy, makes us blameless before the Father. And we see everything in those first three chapters about what God has done for us. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 are... Because of what God has done, that's the word, why the word therefore is there. Because of those things, here's what we should do. This should be our story. And we looked at a lot of things over chapters 4, 5, and now I'm getting into chapter 6. And in case you want to know where the end of the tunnel is, we have one more message after this in Ephesians. We'll be looking at the next time I preach to you, we'll be looking at the idea of spiritual warfare and putting on the armor of God and how important that is, especially into today. So we'll be finishing that soon. But last week, we were at the end of Ephesians chapter number 5. And we 
we're looking at the idea of this, Christ-centered relationships. Christ-centered relationships. And we're talking about the idea of marriage, is that a lot of us desire, if you're married, to have a good marriage or a happy marriage. But that's really not the goal. The goal is to have a Christ-centered marriage. Because if Christ is the center of my marriage, then guess what? Those other things are a byproduct. We talked about all these things we want out of a marriage and all these expectations that we put on a spouse that really they can't fulfill. They're not meant to be our Savior. They're meant to be our help to, as we go through this thing called the Christian life. And so many of you I know are very excited as parents because last week we really hit a lot on husbands and wives. And you're like, Phil, I am so glad the kids finally get their turn. All right? So it's all about understanding with kids. And there's some things I want us to see here in just a moment. But we're going to get to the idea of not just children, but children and their parents. And right out of the gate, I want to let you know what my concern is about this familiar passage of Scripture, probably more Ephesians than necessary Colossians. My primary concern is this, is that addressing a topic such as parenting or Christ-centered parenting, one is this, is that the, the jury's still out on my kids. You know what I mean? They're still at home. But you know what that means? Does it mean that you should never talk about it? No, because here's the thing. I shouldn't be doing this under my own thought, my own will. Everything should come out of what thus saith the Lord and the God in helping me. But my major concern is this, is that you'll think about this and say, okay, well, I can do this. I'm really going to struggle at this. And you're going to miss out on the fact of this, that nothing in your life, and if you're a parent, you understand this, nothing in your life is going to reveal to you how much you need the grace and forgiveness of God more than what parenting will do. Nothing will reveal to you more of how much of God's forgiveness and how much of God's grace needs to be in your life like it will be in parenting and also like it is in marriage. And just to set it up, whenever you read in the New Testament, it almost never addresses children and parents until it first addresses husband and wives. I don't know if you ever noticed that. It doesn't go right at the kids. It doesn't go right at parents. It always addresses husband and wife first. It's almost like this, especially if you saw it last week, is the idea of here's what I want from the wife. Here's what I want from the husband. And now that you got this, and by the way, if you're like me, I feel like I never get past that part. But once I get past that, let's move on to children and their parents. It's almost like the Bible is saying this, that your ability to parent well and to impart biblical truths into the lives of your children it almost starts with a man who serves, loves, and cherishes his wife. And that a wife that lovingly submits to that care and that respect. Now, we understand we don't live in a perfect world. You say, my house is perfect. Praise God for you, okay? We don't live in a perfect world. We know we live right off the bat. We know we need the grace and mercy of God. Because the cross of Christ shows us that. There would be no cross if there was no need for us to have mercy and to have God's grace in our lives. Because let's just be honest. Last week and looking and thinking about some of those things. I thought to myself even studying it. Well I do okay at this as a husband. And even studying this. Well I do okay as this as a father. But let's be honest. We can never consistently be the husband that we need to be. We never consistently are the wives we need to be. We never are consistently the parents that we need to be. Because we live in a fallen broken world. And so Paul here finally starts to move into the children's relationship with their parents and their relationship to the parents back to the children. Colossians chapter 3, I'd like to read two verses to you. And it's kind of just a snapshot, if you will, of what he explains more in Ephesians. But in Colossians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, the Bible says this, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So we see those verses there. Now, if you would flip back to Ephesians 6, you say, well, Phil, why are you not pounding on Colossians 3? Because I think Ephesians 6 kind of makes it a little bit more, a uh, little bit more uh, played out, if you will, as far as understanding that in, in a way that's better for us. Because he's going to build it out, and, and I can tell you, there's nothing in my life that consistently shows me of my inconsistencies, if you will, or there's nothing in my life that shows me more of my need of God's forgiveness and grace than raising our four children. There's nothing more that does that and that helps out in that. And they, because I think about it like this, God's blessed us with four kids. They are incredibly different. If you've been blessed to have more than one child, you can
kind of know this. Amen. They are different. They are different in so many wonderful ways and in other ways. They're just different, you know. They handle discipline completely different. They handle their relationship with Rachel differently. They handle their relationship with me differently. They even interact with each other in different ways. Sometimes you're like, well, these two can be together, but if I add these two, man, it's just going to be boom. You know, it's just not going to go well. And that's when you go on the long trip, you kind of have that seating chart. You know what I mean? Like, yes, you can sit there, but you are going to sit. If we could, no, you're going you're gonna to sit here <laughs> over here because, you know, they even respond to each other differently. You say, Brother Phil, there's no problem. Me and my life and my husband and my wife, we have a consistent plan. We have a plan of how a mode of operation, how everything's going to go. And it's good to have a plan, right? Yeah. I don't know about you, but you ever have, like, this is how it's going to go, this is what's going to happen, and as soon as you get that plan in place, you can pretty much light it on fire, right? Amen. I mean, it's not going to last. But something you have to realize, I think we all do, is we have to really watch that we don't become a slave to our plan, to our principles, but instead make our principles flexible in regards to how you engage each one of your children that God's given you. I have learned in my home, and my kids are scared to death of the sermon because they know I'm going to use them and I'm going to do everything I can not to use them. Because I love them and I want them to eventually love me, especially when I get older and people take care of you. Okay, you got it. Okay. <laughs> but there are certain children in my home that I can do the look. You know what I mean? Like, and conviction from the Holy Spirit falls. You know what I mean? Like it happens. There's some I look at, and it's almost they look at me like this. Bring it. <laughs> and then there's some I look at sometimes, and they're like, what? What I do? You know what I mean? There's this, all of that. And the bad thing is so many of you are labeling children right now. Don't do that. Okay? Don't worry, kids. We're going to get the parents here in a moment. Okay? We, we'll do that. You know, even in discipline your children, you know, you discipline them a lot of times differently. And your kids don't understand that, do they? Why do they get by with this? Man, they get by with this. It's just in different ways that God given, has given us to them and the way that they're wired. So he's going to start off with children here, and then he's going to move on to fathers. And, and by the way, again, if you missed out last week, we looked at husbands and wives. And, and, and let me just tell you, if you missed out, you really need to go back to that. If you don't got the link, I'll send it to you. Because there's something, like I said, we have to start with that relationship first. The husbands and the wives. Now, there's a reason, as it says in Colossians 3, and as it's going to say over here in Ephesians in just a moment, after it talks to children, then it says fathers. Do you notice that? It doesn't say fathers and mothers. It says fathers because we need to understand something, is that the father is the ultimate authority in the family unit. And by the way, that reminds me of something. You will never hear me ever say this, or excuse me, you will never hear me say this, that Emmanuel Baptist Church will stand before God for your children. It won't happen. EBC will not stand before God Almighty one day and give account of how your children grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That will not happen. We are to assist. We are to take up arms of time, so to speak, in helping each other. But I will not stand before God. The youth leader will not. Micah, Will, all, all the rest of them involved, and Johnny and Jen, all these that do different things. They're not going to stand before God about how your kids turn out or don't turn out. It's not going to happen. And by the way, that's a fallacy that a lot of parents have, if I may say that. If I drop them off at church, it's just like an easy bake oven. Give them one hour, they're going to pop out godly for the next rest of the week. I don't know about you, that doesn't happen to me when I go to church. Why should I expect it out of them? So when you think about that, we're not going to do it. And I'm getting that from Scripture, that the ultimate direction of the family unit falls on the father, not the mother. You're together, you're a team. Don't get me wrong in that. But it's an incredible weight, guys. That we have. It's an incredible weight because what happens is those beautiful bundles of joy start to mimic you. They start to say what you say and do what you do. And you ever sometimes your kids start to say things and you're like, that is terrible. Oh man, they got that from me. Because they're acting like me. I, I've always heard this to be true. You reproduce what you are. You reproduce what you are. Whatever you are in your life and your character and your demeanor and how you handle things and treat people, you are going to reproduce what you are. Now, I understand children have, uh, have a free, wild spirit, I guess that, to do different things. But in reality, you, what you are putting into your child is who you are, and that's probably what you're going to get back out of your child. 
So we're going to start with kids here and speak more directly to them. This thought here is this. Let's read uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1. I believe probably every parent knows this by heart. You can say it in English, Spanish, Arabic, Hebrew, anything you want to say. What? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. You're like, Phil, when I started having kids, this was my life verse. You know, this is what I like. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, before I get into that, this is probably not going to sit well. Let me define what children are. Okay, let me define it for a moment. If you live at home with your parents, according to the Bible, you're a child. That doesn't mean that you're mentally not a certain way. It means this. There's levels of authority. If you're still living at home, I don't care how old you are. If you live with your mom and dad, you are still considered in the realm of authority and responsibility. You're still a child. You know, you're like, man, I wish my parents would just get off my back. And sometimes people say, man, I just wish my parents would get off my back. And I'm like, dude, you're like 32 years old. You play Xbox for nine hours a day. Go get a job, start paying bills, and then you know what? Move out from home. Then you don't have to obey, but you do still honor. We'll get to that in just a moment. But understand those things. You're like, man, I just wish they'd get off my back. And let me guess, they're probably thinking the same thing. Maybe that wasn't spiritual, but anyway, we go on with that. But if your parents are still flipping the bill for everything, to kind of stay according to Scripture, you're still considered in the level of a child. For that. And that's not, that's not demeaning you. That just means your position in the ranks have not changed yet. Hasn't changed yet. You say, Phil, I don't like that. I'm sorry, it's biblical. We'll keep rolling with it, okay? So Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. By the way, this is how God created things to work. God has designed it. For a man, for a woman, for one life, an unbroken, healthy, stable relationship. And you're like, Phil, I've already dropped the ball there. You can stop there. But basically that we should raise, a husband and wife should raise their children. And those children are a blessing. And those children are to submit to the rules of those parents. Why? Because God says pretty simply, this is right. This is the way things are supposed to be. This is how God designed it. You say, why is that? So, so young people, let me tell you, kids, let me tell you, say, why should I have to obey my parents? Why should I have to do that? Because can I tell you something? When I was young and I was living at home, can I, can I be honest with you, I wasn't very smart. You say, what do you mean you wasn't very smart? You think about kids. Kids are attracted to everything that will kill them, aren't they? You can have every single toy that they own, put it on the floor. They are running to that bottle of bleach is what they're running to. <laughs> They can go into every cabinet that you have in your home, and they're going to the one that has medicine in it or cleaning chemicals in it, aren't they? They're just like, ooh, that's where they go. You have all these services they play for, and they want to wait to touch the stove when it's like 500 degrees. Ooh, that looks fun. You know, and it's the thing is, and the things they don't understand that, especially that. The problem is this. You don't know yet, but you think you do, kids. And that's a dangerous combination. You don't know yet, but you think you do. It's a dangerous combination. Someone once said this, and I thought it was pretty good. I'm not young enough to know everything. I'm not young enough to know everything. And when you get older, you're like me. I start to realize, man, everything, man, my intellect I thought was so much here. And the older I get, I'm like, I am pretty ignorant. <laughs> the more I go in life and these things. And, you know, I, I put it to you like this. Um, one of the reasons that I've asked God, and this is personal, one of the reasons I've asked God to give me, especially even here lately, really reiterating this, I've asked God to give me many years here with you at this church is because you have and you still are going through my early years of being a pastor. And I know there's sometimes some of y'all like Phil, who love the boss, man, really. I'm really hoping by God's grace and will, he'll let me stay here even to my 50s and 60s and, and however long. Amen. Because I'm hoping God will keep giving me wisdom and and people keep looking over the mistakes, you know, that we're all learning as we go to together. And what I mean, and I'm just going to trust God with that, by the way. But there's an arrogance that we get in you. There's an arrogance that you get when you're younger, when you first step into something. You know, it's kind of like this. When I stayed at home, I had no idea why my parents had a curfew on me. I could drive a car. I made money. I had no idea. It did not make sense to me when they looked at me and said, you have to be home by 11 or 12. And I thought to myself, what's wrong with 2 or 3 in the morning? I mean, what could happen at 2 or 3 in the morning, right? And I'm like, now I know nothing that's good unless you're at work, okay? I mean, nothing good when you think about that. 
So when you read the phrase, children obey your parents because this is right, the Bible's being a very, in a very nice way, the Bible is saying this. Hey, you obey your parents because this is right, but it's saying here, look, you don't think you need it, but you really need to listen to your parents. And the scripture is in a very nice way of saying it. And some of you young people will be saying, Bill, you don't know my parents. My parents are ridiculous. I mean, my parents are just, man, you just don't know my parents. Well, let me just put it to you like, let me use this as an example. Think about this. You know, think about when you watch these shows or whatever, and it shows like the, the Serengeti or the plains there in Africa, and you see these gazelles and wildebeest and all those things. Just think for a moment if one of those wildebeest looks up at his mom and dad and says, forget you, mom, forget you, dad. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to run right at that lion right there, and I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm not going to let that lion tell me what I can and cannot do. And the parents are going to look at that wildebeest and say, you know what? We've just been eaten by them for like thousands of years. And even though you may get away from them one time or two times, eventually we're going to watch you sitting there get eaten by them, probably on Animal Planet or National Geographic, right? But it's interesting that the human nature... We're one of the few things of creation that desires to rebel. You ever thought about this? You don't have to train a kid to rebel. I have never heard one book or saw one book that says, here's five good ways to help your kids rebel a little bit. They're being too good. Nobody goes up to their kid and says, you know what? It'd be all good if you just rebelled against me a little bit. If you would just do that. Hey, just do whatever you want to do. I mean, that turned out great for everyone in Scripture, right? When they did whatever they wanted to do. You know, and we think that, but we're born in that. By the way, we are all born in that. David says we are all born in iniquity. We're all born in sin. And we have to understand that we're born with that. So we have to obey why? Because it's right. And that doesn't sit well a lot of times with us. Now, let's look at verse 2. It says, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of promise. Now it says, honor your fathers and your mothers. Now I want to tell you something, kids. I know you probably did not know this. Your parents are not always going to be right. You're like, Phil, this is the part you need to park on. I hope my parents are listening. Can I tell you, your parents are not always going to be right. But that's not the point. There's going to be times in the life of your parents, in the life of you with your family, that they're going to be too strict and they're going to be too loose. Some of you are like, if my parents were too loose, that would be awesome. I would like to know how that feels. Sometimes, you know, your parents are the opposite of that. They're too strict. You say, man, I come from a family that's unbelievably rigid. There's not a lot of flexibility. There's not a lot of grace. And the list of rules, Phil, if we got the list of rules in my house, we would have volumes of books of the rules that it is in our house. And some of you are growing up in that house. It's the house that you're born into. And I'm not saying that you're always right. But what I am saying is it is your duty before God for your eventual joy and happiness to be obedient to your overbearing, insecure parents. It's just the rule. And realize this, and you'll realize it one day. And by the way, parents, don't we always think of this? If I could just get my kids to know now what I know now, man, it would help them out so much in life. So what I'm trying to tell you, young people, is this. The way your parents are raising you may not be the way that you raise your kids. But no matter what, you're supposed to honor them. That's the way God made it. That's the way God set it up. You learn from it, and let me tell you, your parents make mistakes. We make a lot of mistakes, but God doesn't say obey and honor if they do what's right in your eyes and the Bible. It just says honor. By the way, you cannot have God's blessing on your life regardless of what age you are if you don't honor your parents. There is no blessing. There's actually a promise of God here. I don't know if you saw that. There's a promise. Now, when you get older, you're on your own. Remember, you're paying your own insurance, you're buying your own cars, you're paying yourself and getting all that. There is a promise here. When you're doing all that, you don't have to obey. If your mom says, well, I think you should do this. You don't have to do that, but you can take their advice, thank them for their advice, but still honor them in what you do. You can still do that and understanding that. So we see that. And see, verse 3 talks about it. That why? What's the promise? That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. This circles back to the point of children. Why should I do it? It's because of the way God has designed it. Why? So it will be well with you. You will live longer because you're underneath the protection that God set up. That's the thing. Don't rebel against the protection that God's trying to help you, you know, be safe from. Don't rebel against that. And you say, well, Phil, the authority I have in my life, are you telling me it's good? I'm not saying it's perfect. But it's the authority that God's put in your life. 
even if that authority in your life's a little bit crazy. Okay? Even if your authority in your life's a little bit crazy. Now, it's kind of like this. You ever sometimes think to yourself, why did God give me in this family? You need to understand something. God knew that you were going to have the kids you were going to have. But can I tell you, kids, God knew the parents you were going to have or not have. And God still knew that, you know what? I can use that to help you have a dependence upon me. So, kids, I know you're very excited, but we're through with you for a moment, okay? Verse 4. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So, just to be straight, it hits fathers here first, right? That's not a misprint, but it's fathers here. And as fathers, uh, something that, okay, I'm going to tell you one of the hardest things about this message right here, and last week especially. I am horrible at this. Okay? Confession good for the soul, mighty heart, and reputation. I got it. But I struggle with this. And I think, if we're honest, a lot of people do. But can I tell you, as a father or as a parent, period, you should not negatively motivate your children. Don't use negativity to motivate your children. You're that way made the way it happened in your house, but can I tell you, a godly man does not negatively motivate his children. Because here's what happens. What? Here, here's how I mess up a lot, okay? I'm using some personal experience here. When something goes wrong, what do we reach for? Control and power, right? When things are blowing up in your house, when things are going crazy, when it's the little things that finally reach and prick the balloon and it's boom, what do we do? We go for control and power. And how do we do this? I got three things with this. These are how we negatively and wrongfully, and how I do it too, try to influence our kids. First one is this, fear. Fear. Remember, these things we're going to look at, none of these are the way God deals with us. Fear. You want to produce enough fear in your child that they'll never think about doing it again. Right? You want them to be so scared out of their mind. That it's kind of like this. You ever, you scream, you're like, you don't want to know what's going to happen if I have to come back to that room. I mean, you just don't want to know. It'll be on the news. Father disciplines children. Pictures and details at 11. You don't want to know. And so what are you trying to do? You're trying to produce enough fear in them to alter their behavior. But what do we know about fear-based parenting? It's only temporary, right? It just, trains the con just corrects the conduct temporarily. And you never alter the heart. And that's the thing. Parenting is this Christ-centered parenting. is not about behavior modification. It's about the heart drawing them closer to Christ. Now, here's the thing. I think naturally kids can naturally fear an adult or a parent, but if your goal in life is for your children to be afraid of you, can I tell you, you are so missed a relationship you should be portraying them about God in them. God is, God is just. God is holy. God will. There will be consequences to our actions. Someone said, you are free to make choices, but you are not free from the causes or effects of those choices, and we all know that. But the idea is this. We have to understand that fear is not the right way. Fear is not the right way. Would you rather your children love you or fear you? Depends on what they did. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> but can I tell you something? There's going to come a day your kids aren't going to fear you anymore. They ain't going to fear you. I got one in my house that I have to talk to. I talk to like this. It happened last summer. I joke with him every now and then. He looks at me and I say, you're not ready, boss. You're not ready. You want to wrestle? You're just not ready. I find that the older you get, you don't have to be fast. You just have to be smart in what you do. But let's just be honest. There's going to be a day in the life of your kids. They don't fear you anymore. What are you going to do then? You're going to have to go back to reaching their heart, right? You're going to have to go back to that. So we have fear based. And, and here's another one we do. And by the way, if we do fear, we normally don't do this. We normally have one parent that is this way, fear. Another parent is this, reward. You know what I mean? If you'll just do what's right, I'll do this for you. If you'll just do this, we'll help you out. And you know what? You try to find the best reward to try to buy the behavior of your child. And normally you have one parent that's like that this way, and the other parent's like this, and you're just like, oh. It's kind of like this. Um, let me just use an example. And I'm, let's just throw out a name. 
Let's just say one of your kids, let's just say little Billy in your home. Little Billy is a bully. He's very hurtful physically to his sister. He pushes her around. He does all this around. And so what you do, because you're just at the end of it, you try to think about what you can do to help little Billy quit bullying, bullying and being mean to his sister. So what do you do? You go up to him and say, hey, Billy, you know that bicycle you're wanting? You've been eyeing every time we walked in Walmart. You know the one I see as you're scrolling through, you know, Amazon? If you will be kind to your sister for one month, that's four short weeks, that bicycle can be yours. It can be yours. And you know what happens? Billy just miraculously starts being kind to his sister. Why? Because he loves his sister? No. Because he's been grieved to his heart. Father, thank you for showing me what I need to do in loving my sister. No, Billy loves Billy. And Billy wants to reward so Billy behaves for four weeks. Bike comes in. You and Billy put it together. Billy jumps on it, starts riding. You go in the house feeling like a success as a parent. It's only ten minutes later. Here's a little here, to hear your sister, hear the, your daughter crying because Billy's now running over her with a bike. <laughs> you say that's extreme. I'm going to guess it's not completely extreme. See, the other problem... When we do reward, if you'll just, if you just, if you just, the problem with reward is this. You're creating a child that will constantly, for the rest of their life, negotiate and debate with you. Hey, why don't you do this? Well, I'll do that. But what about this? Well, I need you to go to bed now at 9 o'clock. Well, if I go to bed at 10, I'll fold that laundry. Well, if I can do this, you know what they're doing? They're trying to raise the stakes. What's the most they can get out of it? They're basically saying this. What is the most I can get? Try to raise the reward as high as possible before he or she obeys you. And wow. That's not what we need to do. So we see reward. And you're like, Phil, that's great. Jump on the next one. Another one is this. And I have to feel bad to say this. I've done this before in my life. It's not just fear. It's not just reward. Shame. Honestly, you say, I don't ever do that. Don't. <laughs> Be my, how amazed how many times in our lives as parents we try to shame our kids and go, you know what I mean? You walk up to your kids and you're like, I remember when your mama was a happy lady. <laughs> Just before we had children. I remember seeing her joy and her smile. How she would float in around the house and just be so happy. But you know what now? She's so consumed by wondering when she wakes up in the morning, which one of you is determined to destroy her life? And I know that all of you are probably sitting in the room that day saying, well, I got her yesterday, so why don't you take it today? <laughs> so that way it doesn't look too bad on one of us. And by the way, we laugh as parents, but we do wonder sometimes, do they actually sit back here and do rock, paper, scissors on who's going to do that? <laughs> yeah, draw straw, that's right. <laughs> you, look at her, you look at your kid and say, she was so, she's so consumed by wondering what you're going to do. Look at her. You're killing her. Look what you're doing to her. And what are you doing? You're shaming her. You ever notice in Scripture, God never shames, but he does convict. What's the conviction for? God never guilts, but he does convict. Why? Because there's a desire for you to have the right relationship, not just behave correctly. And so we see those things. Fear, reward, shame are used, and we think they have power, but let's just be honest. They don't. They don't have power. And your calling is to be a tool for the change of your kids' heart. If you get nothing else out of this, understand this as a parent. Your child's biggest danger is not what's outside of them, it's what's inside of them, and that's sin. And every one of us is that way. Your greatest danger to your child is not what they're going to be exposed to, it's what's inside of them that desires to grow and desires to be filled, and that is sin. You know, I think our house and all of our houses should be filled with grace, they should be filled with mercy, should be filled even with fun. Some of us need to be reminded of that. There's nothing wrong with having fun. I think sometimes we get so in the Bible and so legalistic, we think, if I'm enjoying this, this must be wrong. But it should be filled with fun. It should be filled with those things. And we, as it says here in this passage, what? To bring them up into the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we understand this. At some level, your kids are going to rebel against the rules. They're not going to like the rules. And we've already covered that. So they're just sometimes not going to get it. But this passage of Scripture doesn't say don't make your children angry because sometimes they're going to be angry. But what it's saying here is don't try to make them angry. And we try when we use fear, reward, and whenever we try to use shame. Don't try to make them angry. 
Don't take things personally. You want to know what I get out of being filled with the Spirit when it deals with my children? When I take what they do as a personal attack on me. I personally am upset by what they do. I make it personal in my life. When I understand it's the sin that indwells them. Hey, why do I do stupid, ungodly things? The sin that still indwells me. And I give in to that sinfulness. I give in to those things. And so when you think about it, you simply create uh, children who become frustrated with the authority over them. And in a way that honestly is not biblical. And, and, and may I say this, as we talk about this, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Rachel and I have had opportunities over all the years of ministry that we've had, and we're thankful for them. We have had many conversations with young people and even adults now that will look back, and they will just talk about what their father said. Can, can I tell you, if, I don't know how to make it more simple, and this is what I need. This is what I wrote for me. Dads, I love you, but watch your mouth. I ain't talking about cussing. But we ought to watch the things that come out of our mouth. See, we think abuse is only physical. There's many a person with a verbal, and by the way, it's not just for guys. I know ladies, we can be that way too, but I'm harping on them for a moment, okay? You just doing what you want. But we need to understand that our words are powerful. Our words that we give to our children are powerful, and I struggle with this. I can't fully explain to you the power that your mouth has when it comes to your children. Can I tell you, you can absolutely instill in your daughter a self-confidence and a safety in a man who will treat her and encourage her and will love her one day well. Or you can teach her by the things that you say how worthless she is and that she needs someone in her all of her life that's going to demean her and put her in her place. Be careful because that's the road that your words do to her. That's the road it goes down from like, I deserve this. I deserve this. And that starts with us. You can make your son feel safe in how God's created him. And whatever your kids like to do, if they like to play football, they like to paint, they like to do instruments, whatever it is they like to do, your goal, regardless, is to nurture and to love them and to encourage them with your mouth. It is to do that. You say actions speak louder than words, but can I tell you, words are pretty nice. Words are good. That's how we encourage. It has lasting effects. And I can't tell you the number of conversations that I have with people that they can still tell me of instances in time where a mother or a father was so quick with a tongue and how that shaped them and how it molded them. Rick Warren said this, and, and I don't know how you feel about him, but I will tell you a great quote he said, speaking of this, he said, your kid may never remember what you said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. They may never remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel by when you said it and the way that you said those things. Now, let me stop here and say this. I started this whole thing this morning with this. What? That my concern is that you would go, oh, well, I could do better at this. I could do better at that. And you would miss out on the fact that the reason you have children, the reason that God's put children in your life to engage, and the reason that you understand that you would fail is for you to see over and over and over again how much you as a parent need the mercy, forgiveness, and grace of God. That is the goal. If I accept, I need forgiveness, mercy, and grace in my life, it will help me in how I have a right relationship with my children. It will help me. And like I said, it's something we fail to do. But I'm scared some will go home or some listening to this will say, go home and say, why? Well, I can work on this better. That's not the goal. Remember, the goal is not a happy family. The goal is, the goal is a relationship with Christ in the center of that, is to understand that. I tell you, all of us have messed up with our tongue. All of us have done that. I'm kind of a witty person. I'm kind of quick wit. And can I tell you, it is not a blessing. It's a curse. I'm just being honest with you. I will say things and things come to my mind before you ever sometimes like, well, I just don't know what to say. Problem is, I got too many dumb things up here to say and I say them. I never lay in my bed at night and think to myself, oh, I should have said this. No, I lay awake in my bed a lot of times going, I wish I never said that. I wish I never said that. And I regret that. And so we have to watch our mouth and watch what we say. Because I can't, let me just be honest with you, and I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at doing this. But I can't tell you how many times I've had to go into my kid's room and look at them and say, hey, daddy shouldn't have said that. Daddy didn't mean that. And I need, I need God's forgiveness for what I said to you there. And I need your forgiveness. 
Now, if you've never looked at any of your kids and asked them for forgiveness, either you are the perfect parent or they've only been born about 30 minutes. <laughs> that shows weakness. Think about God's relationship to you. God doesn't parent me the way I parent my kids. I struggle. We all struggle on those things. And sometimes I look at my kids and remind them that Daddy needs Jesus just as much as they need Jesus. I need God's grace in those things, and I need Him to forgive me. And that's a common, let me just be honest with you, that's a common conversation that happens way too often in my house. That we should not provoke them to anger. And so you see in this passage here, we're almost done. But if you remember in Ephesians, what did it say we started looking at a couple weeks ago? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, what does it say? And be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It's awful intriguing to think before he gets into the relationships with husbands and wives, before Paul gets into the relationships with children to parents and parents to children, before he does any of that, he says in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit. He goes on in verse 20, excuse me, verse 21, it says, 21 says, submit yourselves one to another. That means preferring each other over another. And it's interesting that all of that happens in these relationships. It's all about being filled with the Spirit, our relationships, and as we'll see here next time, put on the whole armor of God. It's not just a coincidence. All that is sandwiched right there together. It's there for a reason. And when we look at this, I need to, I, I, I'll tell you something, it's always heard Mark, Rachel, and I have talked about this, is that the majority of kids that grew up in church, when they go off on their own, go to college, whatever you do, the majority of them fall away from their faith. Majority of them fall away from their faith. And can I tell you, I am not content with that. I don't want the majority of my kids to fall away from their faith when they go live on their own. I don't want the majority of your kids to fall away from the faith when they fall when they go on their own. I don't want that. But why does this happen? I think a lot of times it's because in the church we tell kids this. you got to do this, do this, do this, do this. And we focus on that outer shell. We focus on appearances. We focus on conduct all the time. And we're not giving them what they need. And I'm telling you, when I'm telling you this, please understand I'm telling myself this. We're not giving them what they truly need most which is a knowledge of the love and character of God through his word and that Holy Spirit that lives inside of them if they're saved. So we need to teach our kids to think like Christ, feel what Christ feels, and to want what Christ wants. So the first time that your kid goes out and grew up in church and, and all you did was tell them a good Christian does this and dresses like this and acts like this and says this, first time they're exposed to an atheistic professor or they're exposed to maybe some of the freedoms that come without being underneath the home, they fall head first pray to that. They fall, they fall away from God. You know why? Because all we did was give them a shell of Christianity and never help them realize they don't just need to know about God. They need to know God personally. To have a not just personal relationship of salvation, but a personal walk with Him. And to look to that building of the character of Christ in them. Hey, you, you can say to this, what about kids living at home? Kids living at home today are still bombarded with all the things that are wrong. you got to watch what's on the phone. you got to watch what's on the iPad. you got to watch what's on TV. We have to be careful of these temptations. So what's best for them? A bunch of, hey, do this, do this, do this, do this. Now let me tell you, it's good for us to have those conversations with them. But what's best for them is to know how to be filled with this God. Our kids ought to know what it means by Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit. They ought to know what that means. Hey, can you imagine, this, this, as you go home, can you imagine if every single human that lives underneath your roof lives one whole day Filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Mom, dad, son, daughter. Can you imagine what that day would be like? You're like, I would probably pass out. But that's what we're told to do. You know what that day would look like? If everyone in your home lived filled with the Spirit of God? Ephesians 5, 20 and 21. Thankful to God in all things. All things. He would be submitting one another, ourselves to one another. Isn't what we want most for our kids is for them to think like Christ, feel like Christ, and desire Christ, and want to follow Christ with their life? Only the Word can do that. We're not going to look there. Our time's up. But Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, from that as a child you have learned the Holy Scriptures. And can I tell you, 2 Timothy 3, 15 comes because of 2 Timothy 1, 5, 
It talks about your grandmother and your mother poured into you and taught you. And I want to beg you, mom, dad, and by the way, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, and uncles, God has you as an adult. You have an opportunity to pour into their lives. Can I tell you, I want to beg you, teach your kids the word. Teach your kids the word. This is our primary responsibility. As it says in verse 4 or 6, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This is our primary responsibility. It's not the main responsibility of children's church, Sunday school, youth pastor. Your kids need to be fed the word by you. How much like Christ do you help your kid be you? All those other things are good. And I tell you the danger what we do in life. We tell our kids to get good grades, to be good at sports, to learn an instrument. We spend hours taking them places for lessons and games. We tell them you need a good education. You need to be a tight, get a title. You need to be successful. You need to be financially stable. You need to get good degrees so you make a good living. All those are good, but not if we're missing and teaching them how to know God, love God, serve God, and follow God. If your kids know how to make a living, but they don't know how to love God, you've missed it. Amen. You've missed it. And I've missed it. And it won't happen if we constantly immerse our kids in the things of the world. I close with this thought. If as dads, we're more concerned about teaching our kids how to catch a ball, swing a bat, than we are how to study God's word, we've missed it. Moms, if you're more concerned on how to teach your girls how to put on makeup and how to act a certain way that, that attracts a guy, Rather than showing them how to have the character of God, you've missed it. We've missed it. And one day, and here's something I don't really think about much. One day I think about this for me. But I don't really think about this a lot with my kids. One day my children will stand before God. And I won't stand right next to them. One day... Your children will stand before God. And all these things that are temporal that you've been beating into them are going to burn up because they're not going to be important. That's why we have to have Christ in the center of our relationship, especially in the way of parenting. Be filled with the Spirit because if we're filled with the Spirit, we truly can be not just good parents, but God. Father, thank you for this time we could be together. And Lord, I do thank you. For the opportunity to be here, Lord, I know the weather is a little warm, but God, I thank you so much for this place that we can come. God, I just want to be honest before you and before these people. God, I fail. I fail repeatedly here. But God, thank you that your mercies are new every morning. Lord, I pray for that person today that is thinking to themselves how much of a failure they are as a parent. God, I pray that you would help them not think that and live in that, but God, tell them, encourage them that you want to show grace and mercy to them so they in turn can do the same thing. God, I pray you'd help us. God, if that means we need to say some things to some people and make things right, God, help us to do it. And God, I pray you'd help us, Lord, not just to have a good home, but a Christ-centered, godly home. Thank you for all you do in Christ's name. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.